Hello, welcome to the introduction to English literature. My name is Ava. And what we're going to talk about today is the basics of what English literature is through different examples. And by the end of this, you're going to have an understanding of genres of literature. You're going to understand what literary devices are and how they are used. And lastly, you're going to know what the format of a story's plot is. So what is English literature? English literature is the study of different texts or books in the English language. So within these different texts and books, there's two main genres of literature. We have fiction and nonfiction types of books. Fiction is make-believe stories and nonfiction stories are factual and based on true information. So under each of these um, genres, there's a few different categories. Under fiction, we have fantasy, science fiction, historical fiction, mysteries, fairy tales, fables, or myths. In this book right here, this collection of books, I guess, Harry Potter, that would be fantasy fiction. And under nonfiction, the categories are biographies, book reports, guidebooks, dictionaries, textbooks, or newspaper articles. And right here, this um, photo of an English textbook would be nonfiction because it's um, factual and based on true information. So in a lot of these stories and um, a lot of the literature and texts and books, there's literary devices that are being used. So what is a literary device? Literary devices are techniques authors use to express their writing or make it better. This is also known as figurative language. So what this really helps you do is visualize or imagine what is going on in the story. And it's really supposed to enhance um, a better understanding. So we're going to talk about six primary literary devices that are used by authors. And the first one is an onomatopoeia. And this is the use of words that recreate sounds. So I used the example, the cat went meow. So meow is recreating the sound of what a cat makes. So that would be the onomatopoeia. In this image right here that says bang, that would also be an onomatopoeia because that is recreating the sound of maybe a glass breaking. Now we're going to talk about similes. A simile is a comparison of two things using like or as. I use this example, Sally is as tall as a giraffe. We're comparing Sally and we're comparing her to a giraffe. And we're using the word as to help connect that. You could also use like, Sally is like a giraffe. And you're still comparing her to the giraffe, but instead of using as, you're using like. Now we're going to talk about metaphors. A metaphor is very similar to a simile, except it's a direct comparison to things without using like or as. So that um, part, when I said without using like or as, makes it more direct. So I use the example, Joe is a shining star. So we're still comparing two things. We're comparing Joe and we're comparing him to a shining star, but we're not using like or as. So it comes off more direct. Joe is a shining star. It makes it more literal. Obviously he's not a shining star, but by saying that he is, it allows you to maybe associate him with doing something above and beyond or super excellent because when we think of shining stars, we associate it with positive things. Now we're going to talk about rhyming. Rhyming is a repetition of similar sounds in two or more words. So I use the example frogs and logs. So what we see these two things having in common is the O, G, and S making the sound ogs. And that is allowing these two words to rhyme. Another example could be news or views. Personification. So personification is giving human qualities to animals or objects. So I use the example, the wind danced across the sky. So we're giving human qualities or we're personifying the word wind and we're doing that by saying it danced because dancing is something that humans do. 
So when we say the wind danced across the sky, it's supposed to help you imagine or visualize what the wind may look like in the sky. So when we think of dancing, we may think of smooth or swift movements. And that's really what the author wants you to see is quick movements of wind across the sky, like it's dancing. And lastly, today we're gonna to talk about alliteration. Alliteration is when you're using the same letter or sound at the beginning of words next to each other or words that are very closely connected. So right here in this example, Sally sells seashells by the seashore. We see the words Sally sells seashells and seashore all start with an S. And that is the repetition of the letter, um, allowing it to be alliteration. And seashore is being closely connected to the rest of the sentence by the two words by the. So Sally sells seashells by the seashore. So now we're going to talk about examples of literary devices in the book Matilda. So I've laid out three sentences here that use literary devices that we have learned today. And I want you to write down what literary device is being used in each. So I'm going to read each of these sentences um, just one after another, and then I want you to pause and go over it yourself and write down what device is being used. And then once you finish, you can unpause the video and I'm going to move on to the next slide and talk about the answers. So the first sentence is, in came Mr. Wormwood in a loud check suit and a yellow tie. The second sentence is, the place stink like a sewer. The third sentence is, she dropped the plate with a crash and a splash onto the floor. So now you can pause and really think about what device is being used. And now I'm going to go over the answers. So once you have your answers, we're going to now talk about um, why the answer is what it is. So the first sentence was, NK Mr. Wormwood in a loud check suit in a yellow tie. The answer is personification. That device is being used because the check suit and the yellow tie are being described as loud, which is giving them a human quality. The second sentence was, the place stank like a sewer. So that would be using the device simile because the author is comparing the place to a stinky sewer while using like to connect those two things. And the last sentence was, she dropped the plate with a crash and a splash onto the floor. And the answer to that sentence was onomatopoeia because the words crash and splash are mimicking or recreating the sound of the plate crashing. So now we're going to do the same thing, but with the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I've laid out three sentences right here and they use literary devices we've learned today. And I just want you to pause once I read these sentences out loud and really go over what device is being used and once you finish you can unpause and I will go over the answers in the next slide. So the first sentence is the children are disappearing like rabbits. The second sentence is he'll need it the skinny little shrimp a girl said laughing and the third sentence is why Willy Wonka. So now I want you to pause go over and now I'm going to go over the answers. So the first sentence was, the children are disappearing like rabbits. So the device being used was a simile because the children disappearing are being compared to rabbits and like is connecting those two things. The second sentence was a metaphor. He'll need it, the skinny little shrimp, a girl said laughing, because Charlie is being compared to as a skinny little shrimp by a girl very directly. He'll need it, the skinny little shrimp. And the third sentence, why Willy Wonka? That is alliteration because each word in that little sentence starts with the letter W. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about the format of a plot and um, another part of what really makes up literature. So what is a plot? The plot is the sequence of events in a story. So there's a very basic outline of what most stories look like. And here it is, this is the plot structure. And I'm going to go over each section of what makes up the structure. So first we have the exposition. And this is going to be the beginning of the story where there's the introduction of characters and the introduction of 
the setting and you'll really be hooked into what is going on. Then we're going to slowly move up and we're going to reach the rising action. And this is the series of events which are going to build up to the climax. And usually during the rising action, this is where the conflict will be um, introduced and you'll see what the issue will be throughout the story. So then we reach up to the climax and this is going to be the most intense and dramatic part of the story or the turning point of the story. And once we reach that peak, there's going to be the downfall. What goes up must come down. And this is going to be called the falling action after the climax. And this is going to be change it, changes being um, taken place as a result of the climax. And once that change takes place, we're eventually going to have to conclude the story with the resolution. And this is going to be the ending where loose ends are being tied up and hopefully you feel satisfied um, with the end. So, as I said, with the exposition, there's the introduction of characters and who you meet and who will last throughout the story. And the two, there's two main characters that you see throughout the story. And the first one is the protagonist. And the protagonist is the lead or main character in the story. And they usually tend to be the hero or just the good guy that we all love. And the protagonist doesn't always have to be a person. They can take the form of a group or even an animal. So in the book Harry Potter, Harry Potter would be the protagonist. In the book The Giver, Jonas is the protagonist. And Sophie right here, she's the protagonist in the book BFG. The second character that you meet in the exposition and who stays throughout the story is the antagonist. And this is going to be the complete opposite of the protagonist. The antagonist is the villain or the bad guy. And they tend to cause a conflict with the protagonist. And as I said, um, with the protagonist not having to be human, the antagonist doesn't always have to be a person too. It can be a group or an animal. So Lord Voldemort is the antagonist in Harry Potter, and he causes huge conflict for Harry Potter throughout the entire um, saga. Then we reach the giver, and society itself is the antagonist in that book. Um, as I said, it doesn't always have to be a person, so in this case, it's a group. Then the flesh lump beater is the main antagonist in the book BFG. And right here is an example of a plot structure being filled in with the story, The Three Little Pigs. So first we have the exposition, and this is when we first meet the characters and the setting. We see the three little pigs are leaving home for the first time. And then we slowly start up with the ladder, um, seeing right the rising action, and we have piggy number one building the house out of straw. And then the big bad wolf blows that house down and eats that pig. And then we have the pig number two building a house out of wood. And then we see the big bad wolf blowing that house down. And we're slowly reaching up to the climax. And this is when pig number three builds a house out of bricks. And the big bad wolf cannot blow that house down. And so he tries to trick that pig to come out of the house. Now, this is when we reach the climax or the most intense part of the story, as I said. And this is when the wolf is getting frustrated and he jumps down the chimney to get pig number three. So, as a result of the climax, there's going to be the falling action. And then this is when the wolf falls into a boiling pot over the fire. That eventually leads to a conclusion or the resolution, and this is when pig number three cooks and eats the big bad wolf for revenge. So this is a great example of the diagram being filled in. We have the exposition, rising action, what the conflict takes place, and a lot of the story really um, gets going and then of course the climax which is the peak of the story the falling action which is the fallout and then we have the conclusion which ties up all loose ends so now i want you to create your own outline i want you to pick your favorite book and i want you to write in the sequence of events in the story so in this link right here where it just says plot outline template you're going to click on that link and it's going to lead you to an outline to use and you can copy it down um, and just fill it in um, on your own time and see what your diagram looks like with your story. So that would be all. And then right here where it says appendix, I left you 
um, additional resources for you. Here are some worksheets with the literary devices that we talked about. Um, I also left a few games. And lastly, there's a video of um, Disney movies using the plot diagram example. So you can maybe see more visually what that looks like. So yeah, I hope this helped. Um, so yeah, goodbye.